Thanks for um, having me speak. I'm going to talk about um, medications and nutritional supplements uh, in autism. We're going to do an evidence-based review. Uh, these are my disclosures. That I don't have any significant financial arrangement or affiliation with any of the products or services that we're going to discuss. And disclaimers, so obviously we're talking about many different treatments here. And if you're thinking about using these treatments in yourself or family members, you should definitely talk to your child or your physician first before trying these things. Um, and everything we're going to talk about is considered off-label, except for uh, risperidone and uh, aripiprazole, which are approved to treat irritability, which is not a core feature of autism. So um, we're going to first talk about treatments that are FDA approved uh, for autism. So we don't have any drugs yet that are approved to treat the core symptoms of autism. Um, risperidone and aripiprazole are um, antipsychotic medicines used to treat irritability. And right now we don't have any approved medications for treating the core symptoms of autism. If we look at psychotropic medication use in autism, we find that it's quite common. So this study found almost half of children with autism received some type of psychotropics, uh, including stimulants, um, antipsychotics you can see are 20.5% antidepressants. Uh, so these medications are used fairly prominently in children with autism. And uh, again, we don't necessarily have strong evidence that they're uh, particularly helpful, uh, but used oftentimes to treat um, the symptoms of autism. Uh, the study here look at adverse events associated with the antipsychotic use. Uh, so you can see that compared to placebo, antipsychotics are associated with 22% higher adverse events. Uh, uh, and that if you look at the pool prevalence of adverse events, it's, it's about 50%. The most common significant side effects are increased appetite and waking. And these adverse events are relatively common in patients with autism. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the treatments uh, based on evidence-based evidence rankings. So this is a study we published a few years ago where we reviewed melatonin in autism. Um, and now I've updated some of the studies. So right now in melatonin, there's three, 33 studies that have reported on melatonin treatment in autism. All these studies except one have reported some type of improvement, including sleep duration, sleep onset latency, in other words, how long it takes to fall asleep, and or nighttime awakenings. And 11 of these studies are randomized double-blind placebo studies that are all positive. So you could argue very strongly that melatonin should be FDA approved to treat sleep problems in autism, but it's not, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so we look at types of treatments. When we're seeing a patient in clinic, we're usually adding treatments either based on lab results. And that's nice because you know, you know you're given something that the child probably really needs. For example, if the ferritin is low, you might treat the child with iron. Uh, you might give vitamin D3 for low vitamin D in the blood and so forth. And so that's based on lab results. Uh, or you use proven treatments based on evidence-based medicine. That would be your double-blind placebo control studies. Uh, for example, these medications or supplements have been shown to increase speech. In double-blind studies, your child has a problem with speech. Let's try it and see if this will help bring out more speech in the child. Uh, so what we're trying to do with evidence-based medicine is make the, use the best available evidence to make uh, good clinical decisions. Um, we use strength or level of evidence to look at the benefit and risks of treatments. And oftentimes we're looking at randomized controlled trials, so systematic reviews, or a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is where you take the available evidence for a particular treatment and compile it all together and essentially get an overall um, synopsis, um, essentially a punchline. Uh, when you combine all the, all the treatment studies, do you see a benefit? And that type of analysis can be quite powerful. Uh, so things in medicine often start, start out with an idea or an opinion. Someone has an idea to try a medication in a child with a particular disorder. Uh, then there may be some type of benefit or, or, or worsening, and that gets published as a case report where you might publish on one child who did a particular treatment. Um, and that's why we encourage doctors, even if you have a patient who uh, just one patient who showed some type of change with the treatment, it's good to publish as a case report because it gets it out there and people can see it. Uh, you can also get case series where you have more than one child in the, in the, in the study. Uh, and then you move up to cohort studies, randomized control trials, um, where you compare the treatment to a placebo. And then eventually you're getting up to systematic reviews and meta-analysis where you're combining the, the data and synthesizing the results. Uh, we have a general lack of evidence in medicine. So this pie chart here is from a few years ago, but over 50% of what we do in medicine has unknown effectiveness. And that's why you can go to a doctor and get one opinion, 
and you go to the next doctor and get exactly the opposite opinion. And that's why they call them opinions is because sometimes there's not strong evidence. So you're going based on uh, expert opinion or um, thought process. So the thought is, well, if we can rank the best cars and we can rank the best consumer goods, you know, why can't we rank best treatments for autism and, and other disorders too? Uh, for example, we rank baseball, basketball teams. Uh, so we rank pretty much everything in life. Uh, we rank things. And so we're looking at the levels of evidence for ranking. So um, if we just go over this very briefly, you can see that level one uh, would be, um, 1A would be systematic review or meta-analysis. 1B would be a randomized control trial, for example, a treatment compared to a placebo with, with the good results. Uh, two, level two might be um, prospective studies aren't randomized or sometimes a, um, a prospective um, study that is randomized, but not necessarily high quality. Uh, 3A would be case control studies. These tend to be, these are retrospective, looking back in time and comparing one group of children or patients to another group. Uh, four would be case series and five is expert opinion. And when we come up with the recommendations, um, we can say grade A would be at least one level 1A study, either a systematic review or meta-analysis or two level B stu uh, 1B studies. In, in other words, two double line studies. B would be one double line study and so forth. So obviously we want to use treatments that have a grade A when possible. Um, so we came up with this scoring system uh, where a prospective um, randomized control trial got 10 points and moving down uh, smaller studies or poorer studies got less points. I'm not gonna spend as much time on the scoring analysis. This time I'm gonna really focus on the treatments right now that have been supported by meta-analysis or systematic review. So I went to literature and tried to find the treatments that are um, supported by either a systematic review and or meta-analysis. Uh, so these are the supplements. Uh, so you can see the reference here, the type of study, improvements reported in autism and then adverse events effects. So you can see quarantine based on systematic review and meta-analysis, improvements reported are cognitive function, muscle strength, and side effects are GI symptoms and uh, skin, skin odor. Uh, melatonin, again, systematic review meta-analysis, Improvement in sleep duration, how long the child slept and sleep onset latency, how long it took the child to fall asleep, uh, adverse events, morning drowsiness, and bedwetting. Uh, Multinutrient formula, uh, systematic review, uh, showing improvements in hyperactivity, tantrumine, receptive language, uh, and nausea and vomiting being common side effects. Uh, N acetylcysteine, NAC, um, again, systematic review, meta analysis, improvements reported, hyperactivity, irritability, social awareness. Uh, side effects you can see here, including gastrointestinal. Omega-3 fish oil, there's two systematic review meta-analysis showing improvements in hyperactivity, lethargy, stereotypy, and social interaction. You can see GI discomfort and irritability are common side effects. Uh, vitamin D3, again, two systematic reviews and meta-analysis, improvements in social interaction, hyperactivity, and side effects are comparable to placebo. So these are the studies or the supplements right now, um, six of them that have been supported by either systematic review or, or meta-analysis, most of these being meta-analysis where they combine the data from more than one study, uh, more, more than one double line study to get an outcome. Uh, these are the medications. Um, so there's 10 of them. Uh, atomoxetine, again, based on systematic review, not meta-analysis, two of them. Uh, improvements in hyperactivity and attention. Uh, some fairly common side effects like nausea, vomiting, sleep issues, decreased appetite. Eumetanide, uh, again, two systematic reviews, meta-analysis, showing improvements in restricted interest, social communication and interaction, uh, low potassium and urine, frequent urination, common side effects. Uh, DL leucovorin, which is folinic acid, again, a systematic review, improvements in verbal communication and receptive language, uh, common side effects being insomnia and, and reflux. Uh, fluoxetine, which is also Prozac, uh, systematic review meta-analysis, uh, improvements in obsessiveness and overall autism symptoms, side effects including hyperactivity, restlessness, agitation, uh, galantamine, systematic review, improvements in expressive language, social, and attention, uh, side effects including worsening behaviors. We do see some kids that become more hyper or self-stimulatory, uh, and headaches. And then the last five, um, nementine or nemenda, systematic review, improvements in expressive language, social interaction, repetitive behaviors, uh, adverse events, uh, most common thing we see is irritability, but you can see GI problems, rash, sometimes worsening behaviors, uh, sometimes sedation and vomiting. Methylphenidate, uh, which is a stimulant. Uh, again, there's two systematic reviews and meta-analysis showing improvements in hyperactivity 
and inattention. Uh, again, common side effects being decreased appetite, insomnia, irritability, uh, depressive symptoms, social withdrawal. Uh, naltrexone, uh, systematic review. Uh, this one's been around for quite a while. Most of the studies published on naltrexone are from the um, 70s and 80s. Uh, there's eight or nine double blind studies on it uh, showing improvement, major improvements in self injurious behaviors, hyperactivity, irritability, stereotypies, uh, pretty low risk side effects, transient sedation being, being the most common one. In fact, I use naltrexone a lot instead of antipsychotics when I'm really trying to lower uh, self injurious behaviors and things like that because the side effects are low and it typically is quite helpful. Um, oxytocin, so there's two systematic reviews meta analysis showing some improvements in social interaction, which is the predominant thing we use oxytocin for, but also repetitive behaviors. Side effects include nasal discomfort, uh, fatigue, irritability, and so forth. And then preparing a law, a systematic review, improvements in verbal problem solving, social skills, conversation, reciprocity. Um, side effects include decreased heart rate, low blood pressure, and increased appetite. So I think looking at these uh, supported by either systematic reviews, meta-analysis, you have fairly good evidence if you're gonna try uh, some of these treatments in children with autism. And again, we tend to target what we're trying to improve. So if we're trying to get more language, we might try mementine or maybe propanolol to try to improve speech, for example. I uh, just briefly wanna look at nutritional supplements. So if we're going back to the ranking by total points, you can see there's quite a few different supplements that have been studied in autism. Uh, melatonin would be the most studied one, followed by fish oil and so forth. So you can see quite a few have been studied. So there's data out there on these supplements. And then these are the number of double-blind placebo control positive studies. Um, again, melatonin has 11, fish oil, omega-3 fish oil, six, and so forth. So you can see there's a total of 41 double-blind studies of nutritional supplements in autism uh, showing a benefit. Again, Obviously one double line study is great, but if you have two or more, then you have stronger evidence as far as um, trying something. Looking at the medications. So again, quite a few different medication study, again, oxytocin leading the way, uh, followed by naltrexone, atomoxetine and so forth. Uh, so the, obviously the more studies there are and the more positive the studies are, the more points that are gonna be uh, added up. And then these are other um, medications as well. So you can see quite a few different medications have been studied in autism. I think there's over 50 or so that I have on the list. And then again, if we look at the number of double blind, number of double blind placebo controlled positive studies on the medications, and we have 102 total studies. Again, some of them are just one double blind study. Obviously when you have two, that raises the evidence a little bit stronger. And then you can see there's quite a few um, medications that have three or more double blind studies, including 26 for oxytocin, nine for naltrexone. Again, there's no reason necessarily that these shouldn't be FDA approved to treat symptoms in autism. It's just no one ever went to the FDA and got approval um, because you need at least two double-blind studies to get approval. And you can see certainly oxytocin 26, naltrexone 9, haloperidol, which you don't really use much anymore um, because of side effects, but propanolol has 7, etamoxetine 5. So again, these are, these are um, treatments that have stronger evidence available. Finally, I would just finish off with with this last few slides on just symptom-based listing. So again, going back to how do we choose treatment, it's either based on a lab result or based on the symptom, okay? And that's what we do in medicine in general. Patient has a headache, you give them a headache pill. Um, so we're looking at the symptoms of autism. So these are the treatments that have been shown to help with speech verbal communication on the left-hand side are supplements. They're organized by the, the level of evidence and the, and the score. Uh, so you can see omega-3 fatty acids is pretty good data, carnitine and so forth, and then the medications. Um, and again, I'll make these slides available, of course, for people that want them, because obviously there's a lot of information here. But when I sit down with a patient or with their family, and we talk about, hey, your child needs improvement in speech, what should we try? We can look at this list and say, well, which supplements have you tried or not tried? Which medications have you tried? And we might add in a treatment based on the fact that one of these might help with speech. Again, just because these work in studies and children with autism doesn't mean it's going to work in any particular one child, but they're, I think, a good starting place to go if you don't have another way to base your treatment off of. For example, if there's not any abnormal labs addressed at this point, then you're looking at adding a treatment based on the symptom. Uh, these are things that help receptor language understanding. A little bit harder to measure in studies. That's why there's less things that have been studied. Uh, here's social interaction. So again, you can see oxytocin leading the way on the medication front. Uh, self stimulatory behavior, repetitive behaviors. Um, quite a few things listed out. Again, these are core features of autism, of course, that being the speech, the social, 
in the stereotopy. So again, even though we don't have any FDA approved medications for these core symptoms, these are things that are being used off label, not FDA approved. Um, attention, so again, supplements, medications, um, hyperactivity, so quite a few different medications that have been used, um, irritability, and then sleep. So again, here you can see melatonin leading the way on the supplement side. Um, eye contact, and your grab bag of just overall autism behaviors, so supplements and medications. Uh, again, for example, Geeko is on the list, but you can see very low evidence based on a case series. Um, so D means you know pretty poor evidence, um, not enough studies to say that you should definitely be, put a kid on Geeko, but it's there because there are at least one study. So those are the medications and supplements uh, based on the evidence review. Again, the main ones we're going to focus on when we're looking at evidence, the ones that are supported by either systematic review or ideally meta-analysis. Um, and I think that's the presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Jiranushi. Um, she received her medical training at the Yokohama City University School of Medicine in Japan. And then um, she moved uh, to the Sloan Catering Institute for Cancer Research in New York uh, and so forth. She's um, now in the Department of Pediatrics um, at New Jersey Medical School, School since 2002. She's currently the chief editor of pediatric section on medicine. Uh, and she has continuous grant support since 1989. She's the author of 100 published peer review articles and chapters. And her research interests include neuroimmune interactions, epigenetic regulation in children with autism spectrum disorders, innate immune abnormalities in patients with mucosal inflammation in the airway, which is asthma, and the GI tract and non IG mediated food allergies. So she's going to talk to us uh, today about her, um, her approach to some of these uh, medications. Thank you for inviting me to panel discussion of the clinical cases. So I'm um, presenting some um, interesting cases um, manifesting the, some of the clinical features which are commonly seen in ACD subject. Not all of them are clinic uh, diagnosed as autism, but there's a very similar symptoms and uh, the common clinical presentations. Then these patients um, really uh, took me a long time to properly manage it, partly based on the like, uh, um, clinical assessment, uh, immune workup, and some genetic workup. So these uh, cases might be in interesting to as a panelist or a parent. So I decided to discuss these um, cases. Hopefully um, the, these cases are interesting to um, the participants. I just uh, try to um, try to present the two cases, which is much more likely the um, gut issues and the my interest is uh, innate immune memory. So it's uh, more like a beta glucan induced like a gut dominant, like uh, innate immune memory problems. Uh, the case is not the real innate immune memory, actually genetic mutation associated, but that was like uh, uh, one of the um, like uh, uh, representable case to think about such a cases. And the second cases I present is going to be the more like an interferon gamma dominant type, innate immune type, memory disarrangement, maybe. Uh, but also that this is more like associated with autoantibody production. And so that type of the condition will do. And first, the so case two, this is actually the nine years old girl presented as um, like a pants. And uh, she was diagnosed with pants as at our at other institution and initially treated with oral steroid. And uh, she was, uh, uh, the major reason she was referred to our clinic is because of the low IgG1. And they are concerned with possible risk of the recurrent infection and the secondary pants flare up. 
and she was uh, she was qualified for the IBIG treatment. So she has been giving a IBIG treatment, which is um, very effective. I didn't give the very high dose. It's just a, it's just a supplemental dose, but the, her condition was successfully managed and infection and neuropsychiatric symptoms has been fairly stable for a long time. And she tolerated the IBIG very well. And she actually, after starting IBIG, she didn't require the oral steroid pulse treatment. However, at age 15, she developed severe abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea and diagnosed with Crohn's disease based on uh, histology finding. And okay, so the and he was classical histology finding a classical Crohn disease. There is no doubt of the um to, uh, the diagnosis, but she was uh, that's the reason why she was initially treated with oral steroid and then switched to the. Uh, I'm sorry, shouldn't say anti, TNF alpha inhibitors. And first tried on the humra. Then she didn't tolerate well a lot of adverse reaction and um, she couldn't tolerate it very well, humra. So then uh, eventually she was uh, switched to the lamicad in Fleximang. And the CD regions well, got better with, um, I should say, and TNF alpha inhibitors. And uh, the scoping, uh, endoscopic examination revealed resolution of the IBD uh, region, uh, the Crohn disease regions. However, she started having a severe headache, fatigue, more neuropsychiatric symptoms joint symptoms and POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And also she started showing the severe adverse reaction to IVIG. That's very uh, striking to me because she, the prior to the onset of the Crohn disease, she tolerated, um, she tolerated the IVIG without any problem for about five or six years. So this kind of the condition always we think um, there's something strange in the host part. So that's a part of the reason uh, why we did some functional assays and uh, we did a T cell cytokine profile and monocytocytokine profile then striking out is an increase in iron beta production. So we checked for the whole exome sequencing and, um, and discovered the two autosomal dominant gene mutation. One, one is NLRP12, which is more like a polymorphism because of the minor array frequency is 0.04%. And another gene mutation, which is a very rare mutation, and this gene is implicated with common variable immunodeficiency. But it's not really uh, known to be the uh, known uh, the pathogenic variant. The NLRP12 um, mutation is reported in the two autoinflammatory syndrome patients. Then also the NRLP12 is as a function, it's a suppressive protein. And this is implicated with a predisposing factor to the inflammatory viral disease. And theoretically, this mutation can increase in the production of IL-1 beta and TNA alpha. On the other hand, IRF2B2 mutation, which is a gain of function mutation, is causing a B cell differentiation. And with this system, at least B cells are 
um, suppressed for the cytokine production. So TNF alpha production is likely to be suppressed. So she has two antagonistic mutations. So because of that, there is a treatment option we discussed. TNF alpha inhibitor was first discontinued because of the um, such a severe worsening general condition. And IBIG was also discontinued because of the severe adverse reaction. Then we decided to monitor how she's doing after the end monitoring immunoglobulin levels. Then eight weeks after the discontinuation of the infliximab to control the IL-1 beta, we started a low dose of IL-1 beta blocker, which we used anakinra. Because anakinra is a small natural protein produced by the body, then can get into the, um, can cross the blood brain barrier. Then also it's expected to be no very little interaction to the IVIG if she needs it. Because uh, anakinra is uh, actually just like insulin, the body makes it every day naturally. And, uh, and also anakinra is a uh, human recombinant. And so very little uh, like uh, animal derived, essentially human product. And with this treatment, we have seen the market improvement of her symptoms. But it still remains to be seen uh, how she does, and she still suffers from um, pot symptoms. Okay. And actually, the one, two cases with uh, the previous um, NLRP12 mean exact same mutation she had. Two patients was treated with anakinra, but the three months after, actually the TNF alpha production increased, so they have to stop it and they have to try to. So this is five months after the anakinra treatment. Um, we checked for the, their high monocyte production, the IL-1 beta and TNF alpha as well as IL-6, IL-1 beta, TNF alpha. We didn't see the very strong increase of this. So the, we suspect other um, gene mutation may be he helping not to increase in a TNF alpha. However, recently she suffered from the um, like viral gastroenteritis. And after that, she has a recurrence of the, some mild, the mild GI symptom. So cases like her, she might need it for the IL-1 um, beta block, as well as a TNF blocker, maybe not for a long time, but in intermittently, or like a short acting, like an embryo. She has to be maintaining the fair level of the IgG so far, so I haven't started uh, the supplementary immunoglobulin. Okay, so the another case, this is more for the um, case. It almost reminds me the, like a BCG induced innate immune memory. And actually, so the two Caucasian male siblings are presented with uh, our clinic with recurrent infection and getting very sick with infection. High anxiety, OCD, persistent joint ache, severe fatigue and poor weight again. However, they don't have much GI symptoms. And both suspects have the, like Asperger-like poor social skills and younger sibling was diagnosed with a high functioning ASD. It's a, in fact, his IQ is appropriate. I think the uh, older uh, sibling is also looks like the high functioning, like Asperger-like, but she, he's not um, officially diagnosed. 
but the he, these um, patients, they don't have a very good response to the antibiotics. He does look like a somewhat pans like, but it's no response to antibiotics, prophylaxis antibiotics, or uh, beta blockers, one common neurotropic medication tried by his psychiatrist. There is no responses. So the outcome of the these two um, younger sibling revealed the general low monocyte cytokine profile and poor response to the booster dose of PCB13. So he was qualified for IVIG treatment. And this helped him to control the infection and overall his condition a little better. And for him, we haven't done the genetic study. And all the sibling was, to me, it's very uh, striking. First, he has a very good response to the C, uh, PCB13. And actually, the, it's almost a hypergamma globulinemia type, then sustaining a good immunoglobulin levels. Then also the strikingly suppressed IL-10 production. So it's something wrong, but it's not like a typical for the inflammasome type activation. So in his case, um, on insurance only approved for the target sequencing of the PID genes only, but it does found for the autosomal uh, mutation, the COPA, which is again, more like a polymorphism, like a frequency 0.02%. But it does, uh, that this, this mutation is expected to increase in the type 1 interferon gamma production. So actually, this is more like a somewhat like a, um, similar to the BCG induced like innate immune memory type condition which is really dominant by the interferons. And interferon, this type of the, or this type of the congenital new, uh, interferonopathy known to cause uh, like a eventually very high risk of the lupus. I thought he's going to have the positive ANA eventually, but he, so far he has negative ANA, but he's, uh, he's not, He's really not um, gaining weight and his joint symptoms are getting severe. So we tried the cell sept, but it's very little response. So finally we get the, um, we get the approval of um, JAK inhibitors, which is like a downstream of the interferon signaling pathway. So hope uh, the First to approval only obtained for Zelzens. That is blocking the Jack 1, Jack 2, Jack 3. And he has some partial response. But ideally, there is a second generation Jack inhibitors. There is a um, second uh, the generation Jack inhibitors. There is a. Um, there is a. Um, only selective, um, selective um, JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, which is only blocks the STAT1, STAT2. It's very specific for the type 1 interferon. I think he's indicated to have this type of the um, JAK inhibitor. So, so this is the end of the G, uh, my presentation. I just want to make uh, the present. There's so many different uh, type of the biologicals and uh, each, especially the very puzzling arrays of the clinical presentations. We have to really uh, precision medicine. It's each patient need to be carefully examined and select the, um, select the, um, the appropriate biologicals. And we do see that those like a different type of the, like a second case is more likely the ACD patient who has a recurrent respiratory infection and like a pans-like symptoms. 
the first case reminds me the chronic GI symptoms and a lot of obviously she's not a uh, um, so the essentially for the, there is uh, several subtypes of the ACD patient and those type of the, uh, different biologics may be necessary. That's my expectation. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Arthur Krigsman. He's a pediatrician and pediatric gastroenterologist with expertise in evaluation and treatment of autism associated gastrointestinal problems. His interest in this unique patient population began in 2001, and during the ensuing 17 years, he had treated over 1,900 children from across the globe, suffering from autism and a variety of GI problems. His research interest lies in the characterization of the unique cellular, molecular, and clinical features of ASD associated inflammatory bowel disease, and his original findings appear in numerous peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and he's going to talk to us uh, about uh, repurposed drugs uh, in his population. Okay, hello everybody again, <clears throat> and uh, thank you again to the organizers uh, at the Brain Foundation, to Pramila in particular, uh, and all the other people who are working behind the scenes for getting this organized, <clears throat> for getting this organized, not for getting disorganized. <laughs> um, so I, I, I really enjoyed Dr. G. Nucci's talk because it really is a good segue into what I would like to speak about. Um, the uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm going to present the case report, and what really fascinated me about Dr. G, about Dr. G. Nucci's talk was the um, the discovery of pro-inflammatory cytokines and drugs that can block them uh, revolutionized so many different diseases, um, and particularly gastrointestinal diseases. So I remember when I was in training in the, in the early '90s, uh, late '80s. Uh, the GI, the pediatric GI ward was filled with Crohn's patients with all kinds of uh, fistulous problems and, and uh, patients who needed resections and strictures. And now it's very unusual to admit uh, any of those patients. And that's really because of the incredible drugs that we have now that are uh, biologic agents, which we'll speak about, um, that, uh, that do impact those pro-inflammatory cytokine. And those are some of the repurposed drugs, but there are others. I wanna go through a case report about a typical patient that I see. Um, and there's lots of lessons to be learned, uh, more so than I'll be able to get across in this short period of time. So I will, I'm gonna zoom through this, uh, this talk on Zoom. Okay, there's nothing for me to disclose. <clears throat> so this is basically a, um, a child whose uh, history was from the four or six months of life, normal development. Uh, from the last half year of life, he was irritable. He had some GI issues, struggling to pass stool. Um, there was no weight gain between six and eight months of age. And that was one developmental issue that he had. Uh, the, um, as far as uh, social milestones, uh, Motor milestones, he met them all on time, including communicative vocalizations. By 12 months, the mom noticed he was the first child. There was some poor eye contact, but not poor enough to uh, trigger concern, just a, a question. By 12 to 15 months, no speech development. And of course, that's, uh, that's how these problems start. Um, <clears throat> a review of his growth chart. This is the one that was supplied to me. Uh, I saw him at the age of uh, six or seven. Um, and uh, you could see that between f six and almost eight months of life, there was no weight gain. So uh, I think that those of us who care for ASD children who've seen many hundreds or thousands of these kids um, would probably agree that in the second half of the first year, that's when you start seeing uh, abnormal findings on the routine pediatric screenings, including issues of weight gain. Uh, he had his first evaluation uh, at 22 months of age, and I'm going to go through this very quickly uh, for time purposes. Um, and we're going to go straight to the ADAS, okay, which was moderate to severe autism at 22 months of age. The violin two was also done, showing a very very low percentile, uh, uh, really in all domains. 
between two and five years of age, uh, the mom went online, as, uh, as most of the parents do, um, started a gluten-free, casein-free diet, which we know from multiple publications. Uh, the most interesting to me being Dr. Gianucci is showing that uh, gluten and casein given to children with autism does in fact increase the, uh, the quantitative amount of pro-inflammatory cytokine circulating uh, in lymphocytes. Um, so he was on that, uh, yet he still had abdominal pain, a number, uh, number of chronic GI symptoms, uh, abnormal stools, constipation, and diarrhea. And uh, interesting, the mom had correlated uh, GI symptoms and cognition, meaning a bad, a bad GI day, a bad stool day. If, if in the morning he wakes up and you see his diaper is overflowing with uh, loose stool, she knew that was gonna be a bad autism day. It was gonna be a bad tantrum day, a bad behavior day, a bad communication day, a bad socialization day. So he goes first, first GI consult, he's five years old. Um, uh, this is a good GI doc. I, I do know who this is, the name is not here. Um, he goes through the story and uh, <clears throat> before any evaluation, the doctor does make the, uh, the determination that most likely his issues are due to underlying autism. I found that to be interesting. Uh, there was uh, um, there was a non-invasive uh, workup done involving stool, blood, urine, and um, ultimately this child nothing nothing was abnormal. There was <clears throat> there were no abnormal findings, and so he underwent uh, a diagnostic upper and lower endoscopy as is appropriate, uh, with multiple biopsies being done at all locations, which uh, also is appropriate. Uh, the pathologist at that institution found uh, in the duodenum, minimal acute inflammation in the lamina propria. Um, and as you see on the bottom, there was a normal disaccharidase level. Uh, and then the pathologist, <clears throat> um, actually not the pathologist, the, the gastroenterologist uh, looks at that result. And, and those of us who are gast pediatric gastroenterologists know that when you see a report like this, we sometimes can see minimal inflammation and, and we, tend, we tend to dismiss it. Um, and this gastroenterologist who is very good, um, dismissed it as well. He felt that the minimal inflammation in the duodenum was uh, not overly clinically relevant and it's much more likely that his issues were behavioral. And, and that's, the, that's the point that I want to, one point that I want to bring out that, you know, diarrhea, loose stool with undigested, undigested food, and it's foul smelling and rancid, that, that's not a, a behavioral um, uh, consequence of autism, but it's a, it's a bias on, on the part of many physicians that do care for these children. And that is what happened. Uh, he goes for a follow-up. Um, he started on, on carafate for a possibility of GERD and uh, or acid peptic disease and follow this and mom says he's still no, he's no better. Mom is concerned and um, doesn't go back. Uh, 15 months later, the symptoms haven't improved. She's uh, now gone to a more restrictive diet, the, the specific carbohydrate diet, which is essentially, as many of you may know, which is a diet that eliminates virtually all grains. And it's similar to a diet from uh, David Suskind is a, a pediatric GI doc at Seattle Children's Hospital who has a, a diet very similar to the SCD, it's kind of a, a takeoff on it. It's called the Nimbal diet, um, available for purchase on Amazon, although I have no connection to uh, either Dr. Suskind or his book. Um, <clears throat> and he was started on uh, paroxetine digestive enzymes, probiotics, vitamin D and calcium with no improvement. Um, when I see him at the age of seven, his height is, as you see, at a nice percentile, his weight as a, uh, as a, as a standalone number uh, is fine. Uh, his BMI is uh, quite low. <clears throat> These photographs, abdominal distension, which is a characteristic feature. And by the way, he's still not potty trained also. And it's at the age of uh, six or seven. You see a muscle mass deficiency. You can see that most uh, easily by looking at the thighs here where they're, they're virtually straight lines. You don't see the, uh, the contours of, of the muscles of either the, um, the arms or the legs. And you have undigested food in the stool. 
And on abdominal x-ray, uh, the, uh, we see a large amount of stool throughout the colon. This is the uh, impression of the radiologist as well. This is the written report. Um, I did a um, Prometheus Labs have a, um, have a, a panel that many of you who work in GI may know, may know of, may be familiar with. It isn't a diagnostic test. Um, it's really a, a statistical test uh, that there are various uh, serologic, genetic, and inflammatory markers that taken as a whole based upon their presence or absence and the quantitative amount um, and the combination of them through a, an algorithm which is not published will spit out the, uh, the um, probability of having Crohn's ulcerative colitis or neither. Um, now, I, I didn't think this child had Crohn's disease ulcerative colitis, uh, but what I am interested in is, uh, is an inflammatory bowel disease that seems to be unique to children with a developmental disorder called autism. So with those unique deficiencies that allow us to label it as autism as opposed to mental retardation, as opposed to Down syndrome deficiencies, as opposed to um, um, uh, cerebral palsy as opposed to uh, the um, deficits as uh, the, that are a result of, uh, of uh, neonatal asphyxia. Deficits of autism are, are unique. <clears throat> and then with those deficits, you have uh, a unique inflammatory pattern that we're going to be seeing a little bit more about and not, that I'm interested in. But what's interesting is that <clears throat> as part of the Crohn's disease profile, you have antiflagellin antibodies, like uh, bacteria, um, with flagelli, with flagelli in the uh, GI tract, um, that we normally our immune system normally doesn't respond to it ignores. And Crohn's patients have a propensity of having uh, antibodies to those uh, to those specific luminal bacteria. Uh, there is a genetic statistical association here. There are um, there are elevated adhesion molecules. Um, as far as their numbers are quantitative, in and, in and of themselves, this combination wasn't uh, significant. And the, uh, the algorithm spits out it's not consistent with IBD, uh, which it's not, it's not IBD. Um, what interests me really is that why would this child, if, uh, why would this child have the uh, even mildly elevated uh, analytes that we do see in IBD? And I have a lot more data on this on these tests uh, as, as, they, um, as they are in autism, but that's for a different lecture. Um, I performed an endoscopy on this child and um, basically the upper GI tract was uh, perfectly normal. I did a capsule endoscopy, which I placed endoscopically. I did a uh, colonoscopy as well. And what, uh, what, what my pathologist uh, found was um, in the proximal duodenum, it was a, uh, a mild, not mild, a mild non-specific increase in chronic inflammatory cells. The distal duodenum, there was some Apache villus blunting and some intraepithelial lymphocytosis. Again, those of you who are GI oriented uh, know the significance of that. Now it's getting increasingly harder uh, to ignore these findings. Capsule endoscopy, we have uh, this small ulceration with an area of erythema. Actually, there are two ulcerations with an erythema around it. Is this Crohn's-like? No, it's not. Is it normal? No, it's not. It's, uh, it's something in between. Uh, further on down in the GI tract, we see a hypertrophy lymphonodule with a distinct ring of an erythematous halo around it. And in the ileum, we find uh, numerous villi that are erythematous. Okay, so are these the Aphthys, uh, the exudative aphthys ulcerations of Crohn's disease? No, they're not. Is it normal? No, it's not. Uh, these are the duodenal biopsies. This is the um, blunting of the villi. This is the mild inflammatory infiltrate that the pathologist is speaking about. And the question now becomes, is, is that mild inflammatory infiltrate uh, together with the, uh, with, the, with the clearly inflammatory changes that we're seeing at capsule endoscopy, are they in fact significant? So uh, Dr. Wilker and I, and I mentioned this before, um, we took a look uh, at that question. Now we took um, some minimally inflamed biopsies of ASD, which are purple, Crohn's patients, which are blue, 
healthy, normal kids, which are green. And uh, what, what, this, uh, what this PCA plot shows clearly is that the ASD kids, uh, they, they clustered together with the Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients and away from the healthy kids. So whatever name you wanna to give to that inflammation that we're seeing in the uh, small bowel of this child and of these children, this is many children, uh, it's clearly not healthy. There's something Crohn's-like about it, regardless of what name you wanna call it. Now, even though this PCA plot came from a terminal ileum, we found an almost identical uh, segregation of clusters when we looked at the colon as well. Um, previous publications uh, show that the, uh, in the small bowel, uh, the CD8, the cytotoxic cells, this is a normal healthy child. So there is a small presence of CD8 cells in the, uh, in the epithelium. Uh, however, in the autistic child with GI symptoms, you have a much more dense infiltrate. Is that Crohn's disease? No, it's not. Is it normal? No, it's not. And then when we look at the CD3 T cells, uh, we find of, a, of a celiac patient, which is E, right? We see that the CD3 cells in celiac disease is really on the epithelium, whereas in the autistic child, it's more pericryptal and it is in the deeper lamina propria. And Dr. Dalzalov is actually referring to this as well, that it's not so much a surface inflammatory infiltrate that we see in the ASD kids as a more deeper inflammatory infiltrate. Um, <clears throat> so with these kids, coming to the refurbished drug now issue. So uh, what I do, what I, what, what I did with this child in particular, and then I'll tell you what I do in general. Uh, I did an induction course of prednisolone at half milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, normally in pediatric GI, we would begin with one milligram per kilogram per day. But in my experience, I found that children with autism by and large can't tolerate that dose. It brings out the worst of their ASD symptoms. Um, you know, those who practice psychiatry know that people, people who are bipolar or schizophrenic have psychiatric illnesses. It brings out the worst of those psychiatric illnesses um, when they go on steroids and similar thing happens <clears throat> in ASD. So I found that a combination of a uh, half milligram per kilo per day of prednisolone tapering over about 60 days in combination with oral budesonide, uh, which works of course internally, uh, topically, uh, that uh, gets them into remission, and which I maintained with an oral 5-ASA, uh, in this case, Pentassa. I stopped the, uh, the budesonide uh, at six months, left him on Pentassa only. He had a number of exacerbations, brief exacerbations uh, on the Pentassa. He needed a five to 10 day courses of oral corticosteroids a couple of times during the first year. And after the third exacerbation, I switched him to adalimumab, which is a TNF-alpha uh, blocker, uh, which we're gonna get to in a minute. And uh, on that, this child blossomed. He became GI symptom-free. And, uh, but more, more importantly, at least to me, uh, or to all of us on this, uh, in this symposium, the, uh, there was a concurrent notable cognitive and behavioral improvement. So it wasn't just behavioral, it wasn't just that his repetitive behavior and hyperactivity um, improved, but even cognitively, even his ability, his receptive language, his, um, his expressive language, his vocabulary, his understanding of cause and event, those had a marked improvement as well. It wasn't, it wasn't a cure, uh, but it was a very significant improvement. And uh, that, of course, is fascinating. And it goes into the question, you know, what, what's the role of cytokines and inflammation in general, uh, whether uh, be they in the, in the bowel or be they in the um, circulating peripherally, what role do they have in the cognitive and behavioral deficits of autism? So this is the list of the medications that I've used personally for this, uh, for this ASD associated inflammatory bowel disease. And basically it's nothing, it's nothing more than the medications that we use in conventional IBD in adults and children. Um, so uh, corticosteroids are, um, are never used as a primary treatment. Uh, I use corticosteroids at the beginning as an induction, really because most of, uh, most of the parents that I deal with um, are, are inherently fearful of pharmaceuticals. And uh, they, uh, 
if I were to recommend a biologic agent, for example, or an immunomodulator, uh, that's not a steroid, uh, initially that would probably scare them off. And uh, corticosteroids work so quickly and they work so well in this disease that it serves to reinforce their belief that yes, there is a, a very prominent inflammatory component to this big picture of, of the autism and GI disease. Um, uh, by no means the only component, but certainly a very important component. And uh, once they see, uh, they, they can see glimpses of who their child is when the inflammatory uh, damage done by these cytokines or by any inflammatory process is decreased, then they see their child emerge, even glimpses. Then even though when we come down over the corticosteroids, there tends to be a bit of a backslide, but at least they now have faith um, that there, uh, there may be an answer in the form of uh, immunomodulation and immunosuppression. I use five amino-salicylates, uh, which, um, and there are so many of them. They all, of course, as you may know, end up being the active drug mesalamine. Uh, mesalamine is um, the reason why it's both well, anti-inflammatory effect is that it blocks the activity of arachidonic acid metabolites, uh, both via the cyclooxygenase and the lipoxygenase pathways. Um, and therefore it, it reduces the amount of circulating prostaglandins, hence the, uh, hence the reduction of inflammation. Immunomodulators, uh, the ones that we use on Crohn's disease, um, cost much more commonly back in the 80s and 90s before uh, we had the, uh, the biologic agents for methotrexate, um, which I still do use, which uh, uh, basically inhibits T cell activation. It inhibits the enzymes involved in purine metabolism. It interferes with the, uh, with the construction of, um, of white blood cells. Um, and it also inhibits the binding of interleukin one beta to the surface receptor. I didn't know that actually until I was preparing for this lecture. Um, those are all the various functions of metrexate. Mercaptopurine is, um, is a purine analog. Uh, so it's uh, basically, it's incorporated into the RNA and DNA of the cells of the bone marrow when it's creating uh, uh, those cell lines and it creates a dummy cell. It's, uh, it's not a true purine, it's a purine analog and it produces uh, non-functional uh, white blood cells. And uh, that of course will decrease the overall circulating inflammatory load. Uh, I use antibiotics in these patients, such as metronidazole, ciprofloxacin, and the older teenagers like we do in uh, Crohn's disease and also with colitis. And we, uh, I use that because um, the current state of, uh, of the knowledge in gastroenterology is that it's not clear exactly why they help. We just know that altering the flora, altering the flora of the GI tract has a profound effect on the inflammatory, uh, on the level of inflammation of the mucosa. Um, there's a, a number of different hypotheses why. It is not felt that there is a specific infection in the GI tract, uh, but it is felt, as we've heard um, this afternoon, that whether it's a dysbiosis or in this particular patient, um, uh, an abnormal dysbiotic uh, species of organism or an abnormal ratio, uh, for whatever one of those reasons or, or individually or, or together, when you alter the flora, we find that, uh, that the GI symptoms of IBD improve. In fact, uh, there are some um, back in the day, uh, in the old days, uh, before the, um, the biologic agents, the, uh, the, the fistulizing form of Crohn's disease in particular, uh, would not heal unless you would have metronidazole in there with your steroid or your immunodulator. And then uh, lastly, of course, the biologic agents. Biologic agents, I, make, I compiled this table of biologic agents that are FDA approved for pediatrics. <clears throat> um, the first three are TNF-alpha blockers. So the, the drug, whether it's infliximab or adalimumab or retanercept, uh, it, it binds with the TNF-alpha molecule, not with the receptor on the cell for TNF-alpha, but actually binds with the TNF-alpha molecule. Um, infliximab is indicated for pediatric Crohn's and also the colitis. 
Uh, Humira is, is, uh, has FDA approval for only pediatric Crohn's, although it's used widely in ulcerative colitis. Um, Tanercept is uh, approved uh, only for pediatric plaque psoriasis, uh, but I included in the list because there are some patients who can't tolerate, um, some IBD patients who can't tolerate either Emicade or Humira, uh, but can tolerate um, Tanercept. And but so, so it's nice to have uh, a drug that's FDA approved for pediatrics and a dosing schedule based upon weight, so you're not forced to guess. And then uh, lastly, there is uh, interleukin 12 slash 23 inhibitors. Um, and uh, the one that's uh, available is um, ustekinumab or Stelara, which is approved in children for plaque psoriasis. It's approved in adults for IBD but in children uh, for plaque psoriasis. So again, that gives us the ability to get a dose, to get at least uh, in, the, in the right age range, because the problem you have when you want to use a drug like a, a biologic agent, which are very expensive and insurance companies are very reluctant to approve those drugs. Um, if you don't even have a, a, a dose uh, or, a, or a, a guessing, a guess dose um, to give, uh, it just gives them more ammunition to deny their request. Um, the nice thing with having Stellara is that it's a, it's a different class, it's a different uh, mechanism of action than TNF alpha. And we do have approval in children. And we do have, again, based upon weight, dosing recommendations. Uh, in contrast to the um, to children, the adults have a much wider range of choices for uh, biologics for IBD. And they have, again, they have the first two, the Remicade and Yamira, but we also have Golumab, uh, Symponi. You also have uh, Sertolizumab. And um, they also have uh, Vidolizumab, which is a different mechanism of action entirely. It's an integral receptor antagonist. Um, the root actually is very important um, because if we have a, an ASD kid, uh, chances are the kids, at least that I see, very few of them are going to sit through an intravenous infusion of Remicade. So I look for drugs that are given subcutaneously only. So the Adalimumab, Humera, is a godsend for the autism community. And if your child is old enough, of course, uh, we can use uh, sertolizumab as well. And um, I have a number of patients that I am, I'm using um, uh, ustekinumab or stelara uh, for, their, uh, for their IBD as well, also with, with good results. These are perfect examples of, of, uh, of drugs that are refurbished. I mean, we, we, we know that they're effective in inflammatory bowel disease. We know that we have an inflammatory bowel disease that's unique to autism. It's not Crohn's, it is an ulcerative colitis, but it is inflammatory. It, it overlaps with IBD in so many ways, especially molecularly. Um, and what's most impressive is that from a treatment standpoint, we see the same uh, resolution of GI symptoms with these, uh, with these refurbished drugs uh, as we see with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And further, and perhaps even more important, we see that it improves their cognition and their behavior. Take home message was a whole bunch of them. Um, GI symptoms and ASD need to be evaluated aggressively, not dismissed. Um, they are not considered part of autism. Mild inflammatory infiltrate and H&E staining should not be dismissed either. And in fact, in fact, those uh, those slides that we showed before of the CD8 staining on the um, on the villi of the small bowel. The H and E staining on those same slides was normal, so that the uh, the normal uh, baseline uh, background noise level of lymphocytic infiltration in the lamina propria obscured the presence of those CD8 cells that were that were pericryptal. So this is an example of a disease where you can't rely on the H and E staining. That that's not the end all. H and E staining was actually introduced in the 1860s. Um, it's a an excellent, excellent method uh, as a first choice, but it's, uh, it is a 160 year old uh, technology. And, and to think that that would be the first and last stop in making a diagnosis with the symptoms of persistent is, um, well, it's, it's, just, it's just wrong. 
misinterpret misinterpretation of test results can delay treatment. What would I like to see future studies? What I would like to see is um, to take these kids, these autistic GI symptomatic kids whose biopsies are either normal or only minimally abnormal on routine staining and even on, on CD8 staining and CD4, CD3 and gamma delta cells and other, other staining which has been shown and published to be abnormal. I would like to, uh, to quantify that and to uh, repeat many of those, of those, uh, of those studies. And, um, and then to do a clinical trial uh, and, and it shows that not, not just the standing cells, but also to quantify the cytokine, the pro-inflammatory cytokine population, which has also been published before and found to be elevated in the mucosa and in the circulating lymphocytes. And uh, also what, what's been shown in the past is that to count the regulatory uh, cytokines um, are, are being inhibited. So with that, in, uh, with that evidence to do a uh, clinical trial using these refurbished drugs for, for these kinds of patients. And I think with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Adams. He's the director of the Autism Asperger Research Program at Arizona State University. His research, research focuses on the medical cause of autism, how to treat and prevent it, including the areas of nutrition, oxidative stress, gut problems, gut bacteria, toxic metals, and seizures. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific articles, including over 40 related to autism. He's gonna to talk to us about uh, repurposed drugs as autism therapeutics. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, so let me go ahead and um, share a presentation, uh, similar in a number of ways to what Dan presented. Um, but with a somewhat different emphasis. Um, and this is a, uh, based on a paper I published with uh, Rich Fry. Um, so the, to give you a little background, the Autism Research Institute previously published a rating of many medications, uh, nutritional supplements and diets based on data from 27,000 families. And that was useful in that it told you which uh, for a given treatment, how often was it likely to help um, or not. Um, but it didn't rate individual symptoms. So it wasn't very clear what the treatment was actually useful for. So we created a um, national survey to rate all medications, nutritional supplements, diets, and therapies to determine what's the overall benefit, what's the overall adverse effects, and then what are specific benefits and specific adverse events, uh, adverse effects. And from that, we could then determine what were the highest rated uh, treatments for a particular symptom, such as a language problem or social problem. So it's analogous to what um, Dan Rosignol presented based on research data of uh, published studies. We decided to do a more global approach for um, using survey data. Um, so we advertised the study uh, nationally. We had, had 500 families fill it out and we, uh, first releasing data on the 26 psychiatric and seizure meds that were most commonly used. And so basically for every medication, uh, we would ask what was the degree of benefit? So it's not a question of is it statistically significant or not, we wanna know what's the degree of benefit and then what particular symptoms were affected. And then what were the adverse effects, which often isn't asked about in some studies and what were those specific adverse effects. So how severe were they and what were they? So a list of many, many different possible symptom, uh, symptom benefits and a list of many possible adverse effects. And so we also looked at these medications see which were mo most commonly used. Uh, Dan also presented some data on this. Um, and then if we asked the families just overall, do you, what effect do you think psychiatric medications have had on you? And most families have used uh, more, uh, more than one. Um, some families, about a quarter, said that they, were much, they helped them uh, to become much better. About a quarter said somewhat better, about 20% slightly better, and then the rest, no effect, or occasionally somewhat worse. If we look at individual medications, um, what we do is um, 
created plot. So on the left-hand bar for each medication is the overall benefit. So amphetamines generally gave slight benefit and the uh, adverse effects were also generally mild, but you had somewhat more benefit than adverse effects, as opposed to say Adderall, where you have um, slight benefit, but slightly worse uh, adverse effects. So in all of these plots, we'll be plotting the degree of net benefit going from medications that had the best net benefit to those that had the lowest net benefit from left to right. And so same for SSRIs, uh, sertraline had the best benefit um, with the least adverse effects as opposed to paroxetine, um, which had much less benefit and same amount of adverse effects. So I won't go through all of these, but basically you can look up any medication like Risperdal and see what its ratings are overall. And then um, you can also look at this chart on benefit to harm ratio. The medications in this end tend to do more harm than good. These are the medications that generally had the most benefit and the least adverse effects. Um, we also provide a detailed analysis of each medication. So for example, clonidine has a high overall benefit, one of the highest of the medications we looked at, and a relatively modest adverse effect. The major benefits were with falling asleep, staying asleep, and somewhat with anxiety. So 49% of people said it helped with falling asleep. The adverse effects, fatigue and drowsiness, and 12%, et cetera. The advantage that the survey data has over um, short-term studies is that sometimes effects won't show up until much later. So for example, with Risperdal, 35% um, of participants said it led to weight gain which wasn't picked up in many of the original studies because those studies were too short term. So these families might've been using uh, these treatments for many months or years. So you're more likely to see um, some longer term adverse effects show up. Um, also, we went ahead then and resorted the data. So for every symptom, and I'll just show you a few examples for aggression and agitation, you can see these medications were the highest rated in terms of the most benefit um, for aggression and agitation, for anxiety, sertraline uh, was the most highly benefited for attention, guanfacine, for cognition, again, guanfacine. So you can look at a given symptom and then be able to compare the ratings across all these medications because they're all rated on the same approach. And I think this is complementary to what Dan Rosignol has said, where it's very useful to look at those specific studies um, to see which actually we have research data on, but this is data from families and allows you to directly compare one medication versus another. And again, realizing that there's a lot of individual uh, variation. So just to summarize, I'll try to keep this short so there's more time for questions. Medication benefit scores on average were slightly higher than the adverse scores but some medications have much better ratios than others. So I think this is helpful as a guide to see what families' uh, uh, views have been on these different medications. The detailed rating of each medication gives a listing of the common benefits and the common adverse effects. So before you consider a new medication, you might wanna look and see what effects do you want to be aware of to keep an eye out for. Um, and also being aware that you might uh, gain experience from other people about long-term effects that don't show up right away. But it's important to realize each person responds differently. Our analysis reports averages, average benefit, average adverse effects, and the med medication that's very helpful for one person may not be very helpful for another. So this is just a, a way that I think helps go beyond our current trial and error approach but give some data for some medications that haven't been research studies done on for autism and uh, hopefully give some uh, useful clues. So we're continuing to gather data. We have uh, survey data now from several thousand families and we wanna thank the many different autism groups um, all around the country who are advertising our studies so we can continue to gather data because for psychiatric meds, there are a pretty decent number of studies for nutritional supplements, there's a lot less. All right, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Ye. She's a clinical associate professor at Stanford University. 
in pediatric gastroenterology and practices at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and Stanford Children's Health. She completed her residency and GI fellowship at Stanford University. Her research interests include diet therapies for inflammatory bowel disease, nutrition, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and integrative medicine for pediatric gastroenterology. And she's gonna to talk to us about uh, repurposed drugs as ASD therapeutics. Thanks so much for the conference organizers for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk to you guys today about children with autism and inflammatory bowel disease cases and lessons learned. I think um, Dr. Krigsman and I's talk actually um, may overlap a little bit. And so I will um, sort of do my spin, no disclosures. Um, definition of inflammatory bowel disease, this includes both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And actually, as Dr. Griswin had said, you know, uh, there's a third unclassified category of IBD unclassified, and um, it's very possible that our uh, autism patients may fall into that category. Um, it's categorized by chronic inflammation of the GI tract and prolonged inflammation results in damage to the GI tract. We screen with a fecal calprotectin, blood results, and infectious studies to rule out infection. And as many of the fabulous speakers have talked about before me, um, the diagnosis is really endoscopic, pathologic, as well as um, sometimes we use imaging. And just to quick review, this is what the normal colon looks like on the left, what ulcerative colitis looks like on the middle, and Crohn's colitis um, with these serpiginous ulcers on the right. Um, why are we talking about inflammatory bowel disease in this autism conference? And I think that the most important thing to remember, and I always tell my patients this too, is that when you have IBD, it's like you've got four or five planets that have just perfectly aligned to cause this pathology. However, I do feel that a lot of our autism patients, ASD patients, may have some of these misalignments in each of these planets. And I I think we can gain some really interesting insights in the treatment of um, autism through the treatment of IBD. And um, as we've heard already today, there is a higher association of inflammatory bowel disease in autism patients. And this can be seen in multiple um, case cohort, case control studies. Um, this one in particular showed a 67% increase um, in the incidence of IBD in autistic patients as compared to normal healthy controls. And so why is this? And we've heard a lot about the gut and the dysbiosis that can be seen in patients with autism. We've heard about some genetic susceptibilities in patients with autism, which can also be seen in IBD. We've heard about this immune dysregulation um, that the immune system turns on and doesn't turn off. And so um, I thought I would highlight um, some of these um, cases, and I'm actually going to skip over this in the interest of time, as Dr. Krigsman and others have really gone through how we treat IBD already um, uh, in terms of, you know, steroids, immunosuppression, and immunomodulators, as well as biologics. I do want to highlight um, the newer biologics. And, you know, I really found Dr. Jonati's um, talk extremely interesting and so exciting because right now we really are doing this shot in the dark approach of, you know, taking a guess as to where the, um, inflammasome is dysregulated and then saying, okay, most likely patients with IBD have found to have some TNF alpha um, overactivation. And so let's inhibit this. However, um, it truly is a sort of a shot in the dark approach. Um, as you can see here in the red boxes, these are all the biologics, the newer um, agents that we have for inflammatory bowel disease. Infliximab and adalimumab are the ones that are approved in pediatrics. Um, um, as well as um, uh, uh, in pediatric um, psoriasis, as you heard, um, 
Ustalara or Ustakinumab. Um, and they all act a little bit differently on different um, immune um, parts of the pathway. Tofacitinib um, actually act, is a small molecule and it inhibits the JAK phosphorylation to activate the STAT in the immune cell. And um, in um, the anti-integrins, uh, basically we have vetalizumab, which is gut specific, so that it prevents these rolling T cells along the blood vessel from actually um, getting into the intestinal uh, mucosal and epithelium. And so I feel like, you know, it would be so great in an ideal situation to actually figure out which part of this inflammasome is activated, and then we would be able to better target our biologics. So I'll go ahead and um, talk about a case. This is little SB. She's a female with autism de developmental delay and seizure disorder and Crohn's disease. And she was also diagnosed with primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is an inflammatory condition of the bile ducts. And basically she was initially diagnosed with both of these through um, both endoscopy as well as liver biopsy. And unfortunately her disease was really refractory to a lot of our conventional immune modulators and um, anti-inflammatory. So she had steroids, 6-MP, 6 uh, mercaptopurine which is an immunomodulator, adalimumab, another biologic. And um, uh, although she tolerated ursa to help with her bile flow, this didn't really get to the root of her, um, of her um, inflammatory issues. And then um, because of you know, all these failed drug trials, she was started on oral vancomycin. And we've actually heard quite a lot today already about um, oral vancomycin being used uh, both in autistic patients as well as the PrEP for the FMT. Um, and for this kiddo, you know, vancomycin is also approved for use um, to treat primary sclerosing cholangitis. And so she was started on 250 milligrams three times a day of oral vancomycin, and she had marked improvement in both her GI symptoms, her liver numbers, and her fecal calprotectin. Um, just on the right is a quick graph of her liver numbers, which, you know, peaked at over 700 and markedly normalized um, after vancomycin was started. Interestingly, she also had significant improvement in autism symptoms, her um, core symptoms of socialization, aggression, um, improved transiently, but um, the, these effects were temporary. So we know that oral vancomycin has effects on the gut microbiome. It's an antibiotic that targets gram-positive bacteria. And um, through the work of my uh, colleagues, Dr. Ken Cox and his group, um, there's also been noted increased um, T regulatory cells, increased TGF beta levels, and an immune shift that happens when oral vancomycin is initiated. However, this um, effect is not sustained after oral vancomycin is stopped. And therefore, um, unfortunately, patients do have to be on um, vancomycin um, chronically. Um, similar studies, um, which have been already quoted, show that autism patients do improve transiently in their core symptoms as well with vancomycin treatment. However, the effect um, is not usually sustained. Um, and so what is vancomycin doing to the gut microbiome and this interaction and complex interplay with the mucosa as well as the immune system? Um, still to be determined, but I think this is um, really interesting and potential for a repurposed drug. I'm gonna um, talk about patient V now. This is another patient of mine, nine years old with moderate ASD. He presented to the GI clinic with growth failure, fatigue, refusal to walk. So not a ton of GI symptoms actually. He was just referred for growth failure. But when we did labs, he had a marked elevation in his ESR, he had anemia, and a mildly elevated fecal calprotectin, which is a marker of um, a neutrophil turnover in the, in the gut and some mild gut inflammation. 
we did end up doing an endoscopy and colonoscopy on him, given his um, uh, lab abnormality and his growth failure. And he was found to have small bowel Crohn's disease um, with granuloma. So it wasn't for this like indeterminate um, type. Um, but another really great reminder that not all patients with IBD have bloody diarrhea. They may have sort of this mild small bowel inflammation that doesn't um, necessarily read the textbook for IBD. So what happened with him? Patient V, um, I actually did uh, induction for his Crohn's disease with budesonide. Unfortunately, he also, similarly to a lot of our other patients, don't tolerate um, steroids that well. And he did have some increased aggression with this um, induction, but luckily we had only continued it for um, about four months. Um, as we leaned down, we re restarted maintenance methotrexate therapy um, for his small bowel Crohn's. And um, he did have some increased um, hilarity, interestingly enough. You just would laugh at inappropriate moments with the methotrexate. Um, we added some additional methylfolate in, um, in addition to normal folic acid that we give with methotrexate, and this seemed to um, improve. And um, although his inflammatory markers and growth improved, he still had a mildly elevated ESR in the 30s and a calprotectin that was still over 100. And so um, given that, and parents were pretty reluctant to start um, further immunosuppression, so a biologic therapy, we decided to add the specific carbohydrate diet. And um, interestingly, Dr. Krugman's uh, patient also had tried this. This is a um, diet that I'll go into a little bit more detail, but um, it is very restrictive, absolutely needs significant nutritional oversight. I would not recommend this diet to anybody without a um, registered dietitian to help. But um, with this, he actually went into clinical and lab remission. His um, calprotectin became undetectable. And so given how great he was doing, his growth was again, you know, continued to skyrocket. Um, we attempted to mean the wean the methotrexate. However, on just even decreasing the do just, dose just a smidge, he did have, um, again, elevated inflammatory markers seem to have a little bit more GI symptoms emerge. And so we put the methotrexate back to the initial dose and he continued the specific carbohydrate diet and he's now in re remission um, with a little bit of um, help also from the um, uh, feeding clinic because um, he had to make a market change in his diet. So I want to finish off by talking a little bit about diet therapies for IBD. I know that these are not drugs. And um, even though it's in the panel of, you know, repurposed drugs, I do want to talk a little bit about how all of our medications really are targeting the um, immune dysregulation and how diet potentially can be a really powerful um, way to modulate the gut microbiome and then potentially this interaction and interplay that the um, gut microbes and the metabolites have on gut healing as well as um, the immune system. So there are actually three diets that have been studied, three main diets, lots of diets have been studied, but three main diets that have um, been studied and um, have shown some clinical efficacy for IBD. This includes exclusive enteral nutrition, the specific carbohydrate diet, and the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Um, these all have emerging evidence. Um, I would have to say that in, in particular, the specific carbohydrate diet, we don't have evidence that it um, uh, actually has um, mucosal healing yet. Studies are still being done. And this is what the diet is, basically really emphasizing whole fruits, um, vegetables, and um, it includes this probiotic yogurt um, that is lactose-free, and it really excludes all grains, all processed sweeteners and um, and then some specific um, carbohydrates that are allowed um, and also no processed food. So really no um, processed meat and fish as well as um, the grains. 
Uh, another diet that's been looked at, this is ex an exclusive enteral nutrition, and this is where you actually replace 90 to 100 percent of your calories um, with a nutritionally complete formula for 10 to 12 weeks. And um, in Europe, this is actually the first line therapy for Crohn's disease. Um, outcomes are actually quite good in that um, uh, compared to steroids, the growth outcomes are quite good and remission, induction of remission, the outcomes are also quite good. It doesn't really matter what kind of formula you use. Um, both elemental and polymeric formulas have been studied. Um, the tricky thing is what you do, um, what's your exit strategy for maintenance of remission? Because, you know, nobody can really stay on this for a, a long period of time. There's a lot of taste fatigue. Even if you use an NG tube, um, people crave um, actually eating. And so, you know, some patients go from EEN to the specific carbohydrate diet, or they go to the next diet, which is the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, or they start medications. Um, and this is the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. I kind of like to think of it as if EEN and SCD got married and had a baby. Um, basically, this is where um, you are allowed about 50% of your calories with food, 50% of your calories with a formula. It's pretty complicated in terms of the different phases and what foods you're allowed as you progress and you get more um, allowances as you progress through the different phases. Um, I won't go into it in full detail, but um, it has been shown in, to be effective in Crohn's disease as well. And so just to summarize the lessons and the questions, IBD medications are obviously an important um, area to target for an overactive immune response. However, um, I think that this complex interplay really begs us to ask, is there another way that we can decrease this gut inflammation? Um, diet, prebiotics, so healthy um, fibers to really encourage the growth of beneficial bacteria. I think these are all areas of promising study. And um, can these therapies help the subclinical gut inflammation in children with ASD? Uh, in an ideal world, I would love to see precision medicine, right? Um, if a kiddo could wake up in the morning and have their stool, a drop of blood, and um, maybe their saliva analyzed, maybe their heart rate variability, see how their you know, stress response is, and then target their medications, their diet, their supplements um, to what's going on in their inflammasome, in their gut microbiome, in their... Um, 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 using, you know, all the omics analysis, it would be so great to be able to better target our treatments and forward this field. Um, that's my contact information. And I think I'm the last speaker in this very long panel. All right, there's some questions. So whoever wants to chime in can answer it. Um, so can we use a normal fecal calprotectin to rule out IBD when there is no obvious symptomatic presentation. Okay, so I think I'll take this one. <laughs> so, you know, in, in the world of, uh, of real Crohn's disease, of conventional Crohn's disease, a field calprotectin is, uh, is essential. Um, even if it's low borderline, as we saw in Dr. Yi's last case, <clears throat> but uh, it's, the, it's the rare, ASD enteritis kid, the kind of kid that I was talking about, it's the rare kid that actually has an elevated calprotectin. And the reason I think that to be true is because the previous studies that have described the histologic findings in these kids, both in the colon and in the uh, small bowel, show a primarily lymphocytic infiltrate. And calprotectin is a component of neutrophils, not lymphocytes. And um, and the same is true for um, lactoferrin and lysozyme. So there is no good stool marker that I'm aware of for lymphocytes. So the calprotectin, when it's there, it certainly you know, raises the alarm, but when it's, it's, it's absence by no means rules it out. And the next question that uh, I, I guess somebody would ask, well, um, uh, the patients who have a neutrophilic involvement and do have elevated calprotectin. Do, do those autistic kids have a different clinical GI course? Do they have a different uh, clinical uh, cognition and behavioral response to therapy? And um, not that I've seen, 
not that I've seen. So it, it's not as if you're, that if you have a more Crohn's-like presentation, you're any less or more likely to improve cognitively or socially. And that's good news, obviously. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I've not used, um, you know, fecal calprotectin as a marker for Crohn's disease. I really think it, when it's negative, it doesn't rule out Crohn's disease, in my opinion. I think you need the whole clinical picture. I think you need the, Crohn, you know, looking at the colonoscopy, looking at all the markers, um, you know, and even a positive, I'll be honest. I mean, I've had kids that have a Crohn's activity index of 22, no symptoms off prednisone and their fecal calprotectin is still 1000. Doesn't really tell me. I mean, you got to go by the clinical, you know, the colonoscopy was clean. They are off prednisone, off Humira, symptoms gone. You know, fecal calprotectin of a thousand means nothing to me. I mean, I, you know, we treat the, we treat the symptoms. I think we should. And, and the other problem with fecal calprotectin, in my opinion, is that, you know, we have to be very careful diagnosing these kids with Crohn's disease without looking at the whole picture, because there's a tremendous amount of anxiety that goes on with already autism as a diagnosis and then adding inflammatory bowel disease. That's why I send them to Arthur, because I think it's important uh, to look at everything. Next question is, is scoping ever recommended without chronic GI symptoms? So the answer Unless is, you're going to pay without insurance, uh, you know, good luck finding a code that's going to diagnose the, that's going to approve the colonoscopy. Right, Arthur? Well, there's an insurance issue, but, uh, but more importantly, you know, you know, the, the uh, in our GI societies, you know, you as an adult GI doc and, and us as pediatric GI, there are specific uh, sets of indications for a colonoscopy, for an upper endoscopy, and you don't want to run afoul those indications, even if you want to, because um, if there's a bad outcome, you really hung out to dry. Having said that, um, I can't help but wonder if, you know, because it's so difficult to ascertain a GI symptom in kids who don't communicate uh, what is actually a symptom. Um, I, want, I wonder, I, I'm assuming that I'm underscoping these patients, I'm assuming that the recognition of a symptom, uh, of, a, of a GI symptom is not being made uh, when it should be. Um, and I suspect, and I would go even further, I would say that even if you do a careful questioning of the, of the family, and you really don't think, even on careful questioning with an experienced practitioner who knows what to look for as far as symptoms in a non-communicative patient, if you still don't think there are any symptoms, I still suspect, I still wonder, I wonder and I suspect that there is going to be GI pathology there because I do believe that autism is a systemic inflammatory disorder that I think virtually always involves the GI tract to some degree or another. When it involves it more heavily, you have GI symptoms that when, it, when it's involved less heavily, you have primarily the cognitive behavioral symptoms. Now, why would it be that an inflammatory disease uh, that affects both the GI tract and the brain would have more of an obvious manifestation neurologically, developmentally than gastrointestinally? That I don't know. I don't know, but we do have the benefit of having uh, at least seven or eight studies that are GI mucosal based studies in autistic kids who are GI symptomatic. Uh, and those studies done mostly uh, between 2000 and 2005 really give us an insight as to the, uh, the, the cellular pathology, the uh, molecular pathology, the, um, the immunostaining characteristics. So I, I, I do think that, um, that you know, I, I, I suspect that even patients with no overt GI symptoms uh, probably with autism, probably do have GI pathology. I wonder about that, but there's no way to prove it. You know, the only way to prove it is to have post-mortems on, on children who with a ASD would die from other reasons and are found to have inflammatory lesions of their GI tract when there was no obvious GI symptomatology present. 
Next question is, is there a way to combine Dr. Jaranushi's testing and GI evaluation to guide clinical care since there seems to be commonality in findings? That's a great question. Uh, and I would love to have a private conversation with Dr. Giannucci because um, I, I, I'm not sure, and maybe Dr. Yi has an answer for me. Um, you mentioned before in, in your speaking and you're in your talking that, um, that when we use biologics, we're kind of a shooting in the dark and you don't, you don't really know which, which cytokine is the prevalent one in a given patient. And I have not gotten a good answer yet from a number of experts. Why is there no test that we can do that will screen? Okay, this patient has elevated TNF, this patient has elevated IL-23. Why can't we do that? Now, Dr. Giannucci in her talk tonight showed that there was an elevated IL-1 and therefore she used anakinra and it seemed to be a benefit. Why is that something that is not available to clinicians? I feel like we definitely, I mean, it's available in a research. Um, yeah, it's, uh, um, we need the yeah. Amazon <laughs> panel, just like the, you know, Prometheus um, panel. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think that the simple. I think you have to run the most uh, multiple like uh, uh, testing. Then also the like, uh, what is the like a uh, stimulant you use? So the like IBD Crohn disease, I think I will use beta glucan to stimulate it. But for the third case, uh, the actually second case I presented, that's a kind of similar high levels, but other type of the cytokine. So essentially you have to run the panel of the cytokines. And also the, I do see much better result if I use a purified monocyte because that is more like a kind of the inner. So, so honestly speaking, it's a little expensive to uh, do all these things. So the- right, but, but wouldn't it be, isn't it more expensive to give six months of a TNF alpha drug at a thousand dollars a dose and have it be unsuccessful and have to switch to a different one? Uh, I think it's uh, for my case, uh, I do, the, uh, so I don't like to use it, those biologic without the good reasons. So I try to do that. But the problem is uh, not to the, like uh, purify the monocyte, the cytokine profile. I found it more reliable, just to, they don't do the commercially, they don't have the, so it's a research study. So how to do that? <laughs> we need the funding, then I can do that. Yeah. And if you can have some of the like a protocol or something, and also I do, I can, I have some kind of the small research, like a donated money. Then if you have like a good evidence, like uh, genetic, that's kind of the cases I saw, I saw, I reasoned it. So I can use that kind of money. And because that's specifically, so I will, if <laughs> If I have a funding, I can do that, but... Um... <laughs> All it takes is money, okay. And I think some ads. Uh, so, things. yeah, essentially for that, not the commercially available, then I, I know why, because I don't think it's going to pay. <laughs> if, you can pa if you can show validity of the test, you can actually uh, get it approved by the FDA and then submit it to insurance companies to cover for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So if that yeah. if that's something you're interested, that's what we do. In I, fact, mean, uh, I see. Right yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, because right now I'm writing a paper for the like a uh, correlation of the um like uh, clinical symptoms and cytokine profile. Then I saw the best correlation with the monocytocytokine, and it's separating like anxiety or pants like symptoms. So th those are like a kind of those paper published. Maybe I can use it. <laughs> But it's a long time to get, is it a long time to get the FDA approval? But you could, you could get it approved uh, by passing it with another protocol in a clinical trial. Clinical trial. Mm. Yeah, that's so the world I... of clinical trials. But then okay. once you pass it and the FDA <laughs> sees its validity and its benefit, then you can put it through a pharmaceutical, through insurance companies to pay for it. And then, you know, doctors can start using it. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, I never done that, so I'm not a business minded at all. I guess I need to ask you, but also just some kind of seed funding is necessary to do that. If we can coordinate. Zero funding is necessary for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, I think that I'm trying to get a little more serum biomarkers, a little more easier ones. So combine combination, I hope. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so you know, Dr. Gianucci, I, I'd like to speak with you privately because we have um, Dr. Dr. Walker, mm -hmm. Dr. Walker and myself. We have a, a huge. Uh, patient tissue bank ah. with, uh, with mucosal biopsies, um, mm -hmm. uh, plasma serum um, that were done simultaneously. And uh, we've, that we've published a number of papers with that tissue bank already. And we can go back and look at any one of these questions. I mean, the, the, the major portion of most studies, uh, you know, is the is the time it takes uh, to enroll patients and get them there with, the, with an existing tissue bank, the size that we have. And we have controls, we have Crohn's controls and also the colitis controls and, and healthy controls and non-autistic controls. Um, it seems to me that we can significantly lower the cost and, and, and maybe, maybe uh, be better able to predict which drug to use. Because one of the questions that I see uh, somebody from the audience asked is that um, with various medications that are used to treat GI symptoms, are there any specific ones that are uh, more likely than others to result in cognitive and behavioral improvement? And my answer is the ones that do a better job of decreasing the GI symptoms. That's really the answer. Um, yeah, I yeah I agree. But also for the, I saw these are, uh, the first case I presented, I used to hold the anakinda. Then it's his, her anxiety, even GI symptoms recurring, her anxiety is completely resolved. And the, that is the part is I feel might be associated with serotonin metabolism because like uh, upstream of the like a uh, SAT activator is uh, IL-1 beta. So the chronic IL-1 uh, activation happening, then it's like a kind of, the, it's like a secondary SATO activator. So the, I think it's like a depends on the symptoms might be the different. And even I feel some combination sometimes necessary. So that's a kind of the case that I presented because you know the first case I can justify because of the two mutations. So that's the reason why the, I can well, do that. Coming, you know, yeah. that, mm -hmm. that concept of having uh, two specific biologic agents uh, given together in IBD, that's, that's become an idea that's come into, uh, into vogue in the last year or two, people mm -hmm. are discussing it in literature. Yeah, so. yeah. I think it's uh, like a kind of the neuropsych symptoms of my experience, I um, but I feel like JAK inhibitor because of the interferon is associated. JAK inhibitor may have a role. So it's really, but I think that each patient will be different. So, so the essential case by case, I can say, you know, like a protocol. That's a little risky. Back to our lab test. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> we have like, Two minutes, so I don't know if we have time for a question per se, but any other closing thoughts and ideas that people have? Uh, I have one question for the Dr. Rosignal. I have the patient who the, like, uh, on the IVIG for a long time, just like a case too. And these are kind of, I have seen patient with um, like uh, uh, a autoimmune encephalitis type patient. Then we start using the biologics, especially like a humanized monoclonal antibodies. Then they start to having a very different to severe uh, adverse reaction. I saw that this one is like a humula. Um, infliction uh, as a lamicade is a little better, but I've seen that this kind of condition with um, toshirizumab, then rituximab sometimes. Then also the um, 
So I think the biologics and high dose IBIG sometimes strange reaction I see. So have you seen any kind of those cases? Yeah, I mean, I have some kids that do really well with high dose IVIG and then some that don't. So, you know, the one gram per kilogram dose seems to be pretty well tolerated. I know um, I've had some patients yeah. do right next to them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for the, you know, sometimes we see the cases like a AE patient, those, you know, even like a supplemental immunoglobin, there's no problem. But then start using like a toshirizumab. Those are humanized IL-1 receptor, um, like alpha, um, alpha chain. And then they start reacting. So the almost like a kind of the addition of the biologics then causing the very strange reaction. Yeah, I've had seen a, a few cases. Yeah, I, I haven't. I mean, I prescribe IVIG for some patients, but I've never done the biologicals just because I'm ah, okay. not as comfortable yeah. with them. Okay. But I have patients that have done some of the biologicals with IVIG through like other doctors, but I haven't had enough to really see a pattern. Um, okay, yeah. You know, I, I think the most common one I see is rituximab with the IVIG. Yeah, I um, think the rituximab is a, like a chimeric uh, monoclonal. Chimeric monoclonal antibody, I see less problem. Um, it's really humanized monoclonal antibody. Yeah, I just haven't had the, enough experience mm -hmm. to see okay. those type of reactions. Mm -hmm. 